Good morning. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. And today our program uh, is called Fateful Voyages, Native Hawaiians and Climate Change. And my guest today is uh, Ka Kapua Sprout. Kapua is a uh, professor at William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii. Uh, and uh, aloha, welcome. Good to see you. Aloha and ma mahalo for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, I chose the title of this program based on our communications. And I'd like you to tell me a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background, and then we're going to get more into the, the substance. But I think your background helps us get there. Fabulous. So please tell me a little bit about your, what, what you're doing, what your interests are, what you do at the law school. So I am an associate professor at Kahuliao Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law and the Environmental Law Program. And Kahuliao is an academic center that promotes education, scholarship, community outreach, and collaboration on issues of law, culture, and justice, not just for Native Hawaiians, but for other Pacific and Indigenous people as well. And so I'm very fortunate to be able to work with both our Native Hawaiian and environmental law programs. I also direct our environmental law clinic at the law school. And that's a practical skills course. It's actually a class that's offered primarily for second and third year law students to help prepare them for practice and ensure that they get out into the community um, ready to practice law. So. Okay, so that's a lot. That's it's a lot. I'm a very do. busy lady. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and thank you for being here. And um, I noticed that you talk about environmental law. And what, what is that about? What, what, how did you get involved and in, how did you get, get, get an interest in that? Well, in all honesty, I decided that I wanted to go into Native Hawaiian and environmental law in about the fourth grade. Uh, <laughs> so I was born and raised in Kauai, and um, I'm kind of old, so back in the day when it was uh, still a small plantation community. And I grew up out on the North Shore in Kalihiwai, which is sort of um, after Kilauea and, and before Hanalei. And when I was growing up, it was really a time of great transition for our community. It was when the sugar plantation that really had been the center of all life, economy, really everything for our small town um, stopped growing cane and starting planted ho started planting houses. And so many folks in the community, I think, really struggled with um, what was going to be next for our community, economy, everything else. And my family, um, my parents, but my extended family were very engaged in ensuring that a Native Hawaiian perspective was brought to bear on the proposed changes for our community. And so um, at a very young age, I, I, I kind of joked that I grew up holding sign, kind of going to a lot of different community meetings. Um, but I think from a very young age, I saw the importance of engaging um, in the political process and the importance of law. Oftentimes, my family and the larger community had concerns about what was happening, but didn't have someone who was willing to represent them. And or if we could find someone, it wasn't someone who was from our community and, instood, and understood kind of what was going on. So truly, in about the fourth grade, I decided wow. I wanted to go into um, this area of law so that I could have a hand in protecting the areas I lived in and loved. Wow. And so your family and being from Kauai had, had an influence on that and put you where you are today. Absolutely. You know, my, I come from, I mean, I, I joke about being a simple girl from the country, but really in a lot of ways I think that defines who I am. I come from a family of Native Hawaiian fishermen and farmers. Yeah. And, um, you know, my, we have a very strong sense of identity. And um, when I was growing up, it was kind of before the Hawaiian Renaissance. So it was before being Kanaka Maoli or being Native Hawaiian was cool. Um, we were sort of the, um, the Kua Aina branch of the family, but I'm really, I'm so greatly privileged to have had that upbringing. I mean, my grandfather used to joke about the ocean being our ice box, but indeed it was because we really gathered or grew um, a lot of the things that ended up on our dinner table. And I think in many ways that gave me um, an appreciation for our natural and cultural resources um, that goes beyond, I think, what, um, what many other folks my age. Okay, well, I, I've read <laughs> an article, a law review article that you wrote uh, for the Stanford Environmental Law Journal, and I will tell you that you are not a simple girl <laughs> from the country because that, that article is pretty deep. 
uh, the article addressed Native Hawaiians and the struggle against climate change de devastation. And th right. Those are words you, that you used. I, mm -hmm. I'm not making that up. And, and what, what, what was that article about? And, and what prompted you to write that? So wh how, how did you, wh what is it about? So for me, you know, I've been involved in, um, in Native Hawaiian and environmental law for almost 20 years now. Before I was fortunate enough to join the team at um, at the law school, I actually worked as a litigator at Earth Justice for about 10 years. And so I've really been involved in these issues, um, not from different perspectives, from an academic perspective, from, a native, from the perspective of a Native Hawaiian practitioner, from the perspective as an attorney who's working on these issues. And really having spent time working in many different communities throughout Hawaii, but especially in our rural neighbor island communities where um, people still rely on our resources as an integral part of data daily life and subsistence. And so having that upbringing and having that experience, I think, made me generally interested in the topic. But about, I'd say about five years or so, I started reading up on articles by Rebecca Sotsi, who is a very preeminent um, Native American law scholar. And in looking at articles in particular on the impacts of climate change on indigenous people, it began to make me even more concerned about how, you know, not just generally what this would mean for our community, what, what, what this would mean for us as a global community, as a world, but what this would mean for my family. You mm -hmm. know, would I be able to continue the practices that I learned from my, from my parents and grandparents, things the, like the that. The sea is the refrigerator. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so it really hit home, I think, in a very, um, in a very real way. And in Hawaii, um, as many of us know, climate change will have disproportionate impacts on different areas, especially places in the Pacific, like well, Hawaii. Well, I, I don't know if everybody does know that. Okay. Okay, so why don't you tell us? Tell us, what, what, is, what is the impact, or, or what, right. what do you believe it to be? Because there, there may be, you know, controversy about that too, but, but I'd like to hear what, what you say is, is the impact of climate change or environmental changes right. on, on, on the Native community and on Hawaii. Right, and so um, when we talk about climate change, I think it's important to you know, get us all on the same page. Um, what I'm thinking of really are changes, um, some very simplistic, changes in our weather, changes in what we understand um, our general climate to be. So not looking at a legal definition, but really um, how things are on a regular practical. basis. Pract a very practical, a simple girl from the country approach to these issues. And so um, in looking at that, kind of what is climate change, what scientists have already documented in Hawaii are things like um, changing. And for us in Hawaii, what we're seeing is, um, well, most people associate climate change with increases in ambient air temperature. So the climate actually physically warming. And that is definitely one impact. But what we're seeing um, in Hawaii and beyond are a host of changes. And what many scientists have already documented in Hawaii, so folks like Chip Fletcher, who is really one of the preeminent scientists at the University of Hawaii who's looking at the impacts of climate change, things that he and other folks have already documented are things like decreasing um, base flows. And so the amount of what we're seeing is less water in our streams and, as a, and also less water in our underground aquifers, which is important for us in Hawaii because um, our principal source of drinking water comes from um, the water that's under our islands. Over 99% of the water that people in Hawaii drink today comes from groundwater sources. And so CHIP, folks at USGS have already um, documented declining um, water levels, um, many of which has been, a, uh, much of which has been attributed to climate change. There are other issues. What we're seeing are changes in weather patterns. So both um, decreasing rains um, over, over many years, we've seen less rain um, in certain parts of the island. And then at the same time, more rain in other parts of the island. And this year, it's been a very wet winter. Uh, many people are saying um, the wettest in many right, years. Right. And so for me, that's all related to climate change. Changes in what we see. So both changes in the frequency of rains and storms, changes in the amount of water that we're seeing both in our streams and in our underground aquifer, changes in our ocean chemistry, so increasing ocean acidification, and warming. So what we're also seeing is um, uh, you know, um, higher temperatures in various areas of the ocean. What we're also seeing is um, sea level rise, right. and that's something that's going to have a major impact on us here in Hawaii. Um, the numbers have varied over the years, and you know, I'm an attorney and a professor, not a scientist, so I haven't actually um, done the studies, but having read the studies that have been done, that have been done by different people, it's alarming. What we're seeing over, you know, not that many years are huge 
increases that will make many of the places that we know and are very popular, like Waikiki, for example, uninhabitable for right. many people. And, and that, uh, well, I want to kind of come back to, you know, th you're opening a, a really a, a wide number of topics. Uh, you know, there's a lot of economic right. I problems with uh, a rise of sea level in Waikiki. Exactly. Okay. But I, I want to also talk about the, uh, the Native Hawaiian issue. I want you right. to focus a little bit about that. Your, your article discussed a clash, mm -hmm. and that's the word you used, between natural resources and in indigenous people's rights on the one hand and Western imposed values and practices on the other hand. And you wrote, quote, that clash even today is nearly always about more than competing land or water uses. It is steeped in a, in a history of conquest, confiscation, cultural suppression, betrayal, and halting reparative initiatives. What are you talking about? What are you talking about there? It seems like two things, climate change and colonialism. But what Well, then I guess for, for me, those, are two, those can be at least, and at least in the context of Hawaii, two sides of the same coin in many instances. Um, and so to, to back it up a little bit, I think it's important to understand the impacts of climate change on Native Hawaiians and other indigenous people. I think it's um, vital to understand our connection to our resources, our natural and cultural resources. So for us as Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiians, um, we have an origin story, the Kumulipo, that ties us to the beginning of time in Hawaii, really. And like other indigenous people, um, we believe that um, we have a familiar relationship to these islands. So we believe that Papa and Wakea came together and actually gave birth to the islands. And then after all of the islands were born, that Wakea had a child with Ho'ohoku Kalani. And unfortunately, that child was stillborn. But where they buried him outside of their home, a kalo plant grew mm. from his grave. And then Wakea and Ho'ohoku Kalani had a second child. And that second child was the first Kanaka Maoli, the first human child born mm -hmm. here in these islands. And so um, for us, this story helps to explain our familial relationship um, to the islands as an ancestor, um, to Kalo in particular as an elder sibling. And actually it helps, uh, for me it really defines our relationship to these islands as a kuleana. And many people define kuleana as right, but truly, it means responsibility and privilege. And so for us as Native Hawaiians, we have the responsibility and privilege to malama to take care of these resources for present and future generations. So really as a public trust. And so because of that, because we have this familial relationship to place, for us, the impacts of climate change um, will not just affect resources, but affect our identity as a people. One of the impacts of climate change is um, declining base lows or decreasing stream levels, as I've, as I've mentioned. And um, if that happens, and also rising sea levels, if that happens, many of, if that continues to happen, I should say, at the rate that it has, many of the areas that have been favored for traditional Native Hawaiian agriculture and aquaculture will no longer be available for those particular practices. And so for me, if we cannot continue um, to carry on the practices that define who we are as a people, our culture will cease to exist. Mm -hmm. It's not like we can just you know, go to the Bishop Museum to learn about what we used to do. We want to be able to actually continue these practices, pass them on to our children. I mean, my kids eat poi for breakfast. My son had poi for breakfast this morning. So for us, this is a major issue, whether or not we'll have enough um, water to be able to continue to grow th our traditional foods. And, and your explanation uh, of the history and the background uh, right. of the cultural uh, founding of, of Hawaii right. helps, ex and, and the responsibility right. helps explain the motivation uh, to me right. and, and others as to why Native Hawaiians feel this way and want some of these changes in order to uh, proceed to protect what they see as their heritage and their culture. Is that is that? Absolutely. Right. I mean, we're on the front lines of the struggle here. Um, what happens with, with the impacts that we're seeing, whether it's a result of climate change or something else, are very real for our communities, um, for future generations, for the ability of our culture to thrive. And so for us, this is about more than, you know, specific stream flow levels or, you know, changing ocean chemistry or even looking right. at, um, 
even looking at the impacts on native animals and our malka reaches, you know, as, as, as we have, you know, drying of our forests, as we have more invasive species. I mean, we believe we have a familial relationship to all of our natural and cultural resources in Hawaii. So it's our kuleana, it's our duty to do something about it. You know, fortunately, we also have incredibly strong constitutional provisions that makes it more than just our kuleana to take care of these things. It's definitely the responsibility of our decision makers here locally in Hawaii to also take action to remedy some well, that, of these that, issues. That really helps. And the background that you provide, mm -hmm. uh, I know there's much more to talk right. about, but in, the, in that background helps people to understand, and I, th I think that has to be communicated. Right. And the other thing I'd like to talk to you about, and, and then we're going to take a, a little break right now, but the other thing I want to talk about is uh, what do we do about it? What right. do we do about these problems? And what's what guidance? And you mentioned that there's constitutional protections. I, I want to talk after the break a little bit about what does exist and what we can right. do about it. And at this point, we'll take a break, and then we'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kauilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for Likeable Science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. All right, we are back, uh, and we are talking uh, with Kapua Sprout about uh, fateful voyages, fateful voyages. And I, in my mind, see a fateful voyage of a, 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 a four-masted sailing ship coming towards the island uh, uh, and people on the beach looking out and seeing it. And what do they know, what to expect at that time in 1778? Nobody knew. Nobody knew about climate change. Nobody knew about the effect on the people of Hawaii. Now, Kapua, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about these things? I mean, I read an article that says, uh, I'll read the article. The article says that some 37,000 Hawaii homes could be underwater by the year 2100. Uh, what can we do about it? I mean, it, it does affect Native Hawaiians. You explain that, that the Native Hawaiians feel a responsibility towards the land. Native Hawaiians have this background cultural um, history that makes them protectors of the land. But there's a lot more people here, all types of people on the islands. How are we going to protect them? What are we going to do to about the sea rise, about the climate change that Get, gets rid of the water. If you look in Kaka'ako, right. there's all these condos coming up. Right. How are people going to drink? What are we going to do? What, what exists and what can we do? Well, fortunately in Hawaii, we have very strong provisions within our state constitution um, under the public trust, Article 11, Section 1, Article 11, Section 1, 7. We also have specific protections for traditional and customary Native Hawaiian rights and practices in under, under Article 12, Section 7 of our state constitution. And I think beyond these constitutional mandates, we have um, all of those provisions have very strong restorative justice underpinnings to our laws. And so in Hawaii, we're very fortunate because we have mechanisms in place that decision makers can utilize in order to address these issues. We have a framework. We have a framework. And in what place. do what do those decision makers? Well, who are they, and what do they need to do? What what do they need to do to actually accomplish the goal? 
So in Hawaii, under Article 12, Section 7 of our state constitution, decision makers, for example, people on the Board of Land and Natural Resources, people on the Water Commission, who are on the Land Use Commission, who are grappling with issues or permits or anything that could impact um, natural and cultural resources are already required to specifically consider the impact on these resources and in particular on traditional and customary Native Hawaiian practices that are reliant upon them. Now this is nothing new. The laws have been on the books since 1978 and since 2000 the Hawaii Supreme Court actually articulated a three-part test in a decision called Kapa'akai o Ka'aina that tells decision makers, okay when you're looking at these issues this is what you need to consider. What's the impact on the resource? What's the impact upon the practice reliant upon it? And what mitigation, if any, is necessary if this is going to go forward? But even though we've had these laws in the books, decision makers have really struggled with how to truly implement them in a way that's going to give life and effect to the restorative justice underpinnings of the law. And so one of the things that the Stanford article um, offers is an analytical framework that, that offers a four-part test in the form of international human rights norms that are really a key aspect of both restorative justice and self-determination and helps decision makers in the sense that it says, okay, these, these four cultural norms are both um, salient dimensions of restorative justice, but together they also comprise an analytic framework. So if decision makers can utilize these norms when they're faced with issues that impact Native Hawaiian natural and cultural resources, they could give life to the law in a way that would both um, effectuate the restorative justice underpinnings and that could proactively combat climate change impacts. And what are those four norms? What, what so these four norms are um, cultural integrity, lands and resources, um, social welfare and development, and self-determination. And these four norms aren't actually something that I came up with. Um, they were developed by um, S. James Anaya, who is a very noted um, Native American law professor. He was also formerly the United Nations Special Rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples. And he, in looking at the condition of Native Hawaiians, um, articulated these four norms as salient um, dimensions of, a, of restorative justice. But what I have suggested is that we should use these norms together as an analytic framework to aid um, decision makers in both effectuating the restorative justice underpinnings of the laws, but also specifically to combat climate change in Hawaii. Where, where can, where, you know, if I'm a decision right. maker, I'm, I'm there and I'm, uh, I, I come to this meeting to, at the land board and I have to make this, some sort of a decision mm -hmm. on, on something that's being asked me, where do I find these norms or how do I, what, how do I educate myself to, to learn about the norms? So one of the easy things you can do to educate yourself about the norms, you can check out the, my article that just came out okay. <laughs> in the Stanford Environmental Law Journal. Um, it helps to articulate because these are um, pretty complicated, but it explains both how the analytic framework can be deployed and how the norms kind of work together. But really, um, in a very basic sense, as a decision maker, um, these norms are really rather simple. And, and even though they're a four-part test, they're really inextricably intertwined. So that means, for example, say that you are on the Water Commission and someone comes before you and wants a permit for water. If you're looking at, okay, how much water, what are the competing demands, and does water need to stay in the streams for things like environmental purposes, or stream restoration, or to support the cultivation of kalo downstream, or can it be taken off stream for private commercial use, you'd weigh, okay, what's the impact on the cultural integrity? What's the impact on lands and other resources? What's the impact on the social welfare and development of the Native Hawaiian community that will be impacted by this? And then how does this affect self-determination or self-governance? So really, um, it's pretty simple. I mean, this is not rocket science. This is common sense conservation that really, I, but I, that I think can be deployed very effectively to, um, to address these issues on the local level. And the reason that this is important is because around the world, we've seen people really grappling with climate change and it's been very difficult to address. Litigation has not been very successful. If you look at what happened in Paris, we've been unable to agree um, about what needs to be done all around the world. And so increasingly, international human rights scholars have been encouraging people to take action on the local level. And so this is one very simple but concrete way that decision makers in Hawaii can make use of um, laws that are already on the books but simply inf infuse these international human rights norms into their decision making in a way that can have very real 
impacts, not just for Native Hawaiians, but for all of us in Hawaii. Well, well right. I mean, you, you know, we, have, we already have a framework right. as opposed to most of the rest of the world. Right. And we, you talk about uh, the impact on Native Hawaiians, but the way I see it, it's the impact on everybody that lives here. That's exactly right. You know, we had a very wise man who came to the law school to speak last week, and he said, a benefit for Native Hawaiians is a benefit for all. And that is exactly the case here. Preserving natural and cultural resources, um, ensuring that we have enough water flowing in our streams, ensuring that we have a sufficient drinking water supply in order to support our communities into the future, that's not just going to benefit Native Hawaiians. That's going to benefit all of us who call Hawaii home. And so um, what I'm hoping is that we're offering this tool that Native Hawaiians have been very um, proactive in utilizing and kind of holding decision makers feet to the fire but really that's not going to benefit just Native Hawaiian communities it will benefit all of us who call Hawaii home right and and I, I see that there, there there could be a conflict between economic uh, needs or economic requests and living in Hawaii yes. uh, with an environment that is allows us all to live together. Uh. Absolutely. There's always a potential for conflict. But I think in these times of increasing temperature and rising sea levels, as people who live on islands, we need to reach down and grab ourselves some courage and make the tough decisions in order to ensure that we can stay here <laughs> into the future. And, so, you, you know, and, and, you know, we have the framework. We have the framework. We have some guidance. Now, I, I also was interested at the end of your uh, article. Right. Okay, you included a, uh, an, a Hawaiian chant. Right. A few, couple hundred years old. Two hundred. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was that about? Could, could you explain what the chant, sure. what the meaning of the chant was? The Hawaiian so, chant. So, um, at the end of the article, I concluded it with a reference to the Wanana or prophecy that was chanted by Kahuna um, on the walls of Pakuheiau on the island of Molokai about two hundred years ago. My husband was a, a student of Kumujan Kaimi Kawas, and he shared that one on with us. And it really talks about how the island of Molokai will be overcome by the driving rain and burning death. And um, it's really quite dramatic, but it talks about, it prophesies the annihilation of contemporary society as we know it. But it also talks about how from this destruction, the people of the earth, the people rooted in the lepopopolo, the dark soil, will rise up like a great wave to take control. And I think that time has come. Um, it's, it's really time for us, who are kind of on, on the front lines of climate change, to make the tough decisions that we need to in order to ensure not just that our indigenous culture can persevere, but that we as people who live on islands in the middle of the very salty Pacific Ocean can ensure that we endure here into perpetuity. Thank you very much. I enjoyed our talk today, and uh, aloha. Mahalo. <laughs>